I am joined by many of the Young Onset Council here. I'm Polly Dawkins. I am here in uh, Boulder, Colorado at the Davis Finney Foundation headquarters. Amy, would you introduce yourself and the topic that we'll be chatting about today and why we've chosen this topic? Sure, I am Amy. I am in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, beautiful day over here, although the weather's been really wacky, not as wacky as in California. Today, our topic is um, regaining confidence, which um, is all about sort of finding ourselves in our different bodies, our different identities, and trying to figure out what to do with them based on what our lives used to be like. And our um, this topic is pretty, I think all the topics we talk about here are pretty much all the same topic. And that is sort of, you know, how do we, how do we deal with loss and how do we deal with new identities and how do we move forward into a meaningful life and um, make the best of it? So it's kind of all the same soup, right? Um, but today we're mostly talking about people who are diagnosed young onset are mostly in their 20s, 30s, 40s, right? 50s. And um, oftentimes when we are diagnosed at a young age, we are operating in the middle of an otherwise really active life. Or um, sometimes we're sort of at the peak of our, of our competence and our confidence and our skills and sometimes professional accomplishments. And, and that's a peak that's really hard to sort of uh, fall down from. Um, so that's what we're talking about. I think the, the theme of today is kind of like, can I still do this? You know, can I still do what I used to do? And um, what I have found is that uh, I, you know, I used to have social circles and professional circles that have, that were sort of centered around people with common interests. And a lot of those common interests were, um, for, you know, activity based. And, and now I find myself sort of looking on the outside of that circle in back to what used to be my, my native habitat and uh, trying to figure out what to do. So that's, uh, that's our topic. It's kind of broad, maybe a little bit undefined. I'm feeling a little, um, I feel like I'm losing my confidence right now. Public speaking is one thing that is at the forefront of this. So you might be able to sort of see our topic in action in real time <laughs> as we go. But uh, for the most part, I think that um, this confidence that we're talking about when it comes to young onset really manifests itself in three different areas. And one is something that I'm hoping Tom will start us off on, and that is that, you know, the professional sphere, it's a little bit different talking about, you know, do we keep our jobs? Do we disclose all the different employment uh, decisions and aspects of this diagnosis? But it's another thing to sort of think about all the things that we used to do that we might now back away from because we're a little bit nervous about how we're going to be. Like, so can we still do this? Can we still go to conferences, make presentations, or stand, even just stand all day if that's our job. You know, um, even just going out to um, happy hour after work with some colleagues, you know, all those things that we took for granted as part of our other lives now sort of, uh, I, I have to stop and think, can I do this? And the other area is in our social, our social connections. I know that I have a difference between my friends that I used to know before I was diagnosed, my old friends, and then my new friends. And sometimes when I got my old friends, I feel really self-conscious because they, they knew me back then. Um, and then the third area is our physical activities and lives and um, what we used to be able to do. And this, in this area, I have a thing that I'm afraid of, and I call it a really long day, capital R, capital L, capital I'm, I'm really scared of sort of planning a day where I don't, where I won't be coming home until hours and hours later because I don't know how to manage the uncertainty of how I'm gonna feel. So, um, you know, a day out fishing or canoeing or kayaking or skiing or, or traveling, those, those are things now that, uh, I'm hoping that we can talk about gaining, regaining our confidence in. So that's the intro. Uh, and Tom, did you want to talk about being the professional or 
or just, you know, working, continuing to work in the same way that you used to do. Okay. And now feeling a little bit uneasy. Now feeling uneasy because I was late. <laughs> well, and I, I want to talk about being late too, because uh, I always am. It's been a thing lately. Yeah, I, I was logged in as part of the audience and I could see you guys, but you couldn't see me. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, thanks, Amy. <clears throat> I was diagnosed uh, 13 and a half years ago or so. And I worked for eight years beyond that point till I just uh, made some decisions that worked that were right for me to leave work and, and go about my, my merry way doing primarily volunteer work since then. But at any rate, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of reasons that people leave working. And a lot of it has to do with some of the, the social pressures that are on you as a person working Although in my case, I think it was more of a, um, a responsibility, a fiscal responsibility as, as a part owner of the company and executive officer with the corporation. I, I felt like it was best for me to step down so that uh, so decisions that I might make in haste or just without, without having my hands around because of Parkinson's or because of my inability to keep up with the, the, what was going on at the company and in the industry at that time. I just felt it was my duty to step aside so that people could, uh, that, you know, that, that I wouldn't cause the company any, any trouble or problems down the road. So that was my big reason for leaving. But um, I don't feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I tell people I miss work. I don't miss working, but I miss work. Uh, I, the great friends that I had there, great friends in the industry, great friends at the company that, that I was a uh, party to and and that was really hard to step away from. And it's been harder really to, stay, to keep, keep in touch with them because they're still really very busy. And I'm not as busy as they are, at least not in the same things. And I tend to be uh, kind of overlooked. They, 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 kinda, I, they left me behind, which is, I get that. I understand that. But that's, 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 a, that's a sore sore point for me. So I think there's, there's, there's got to be a balance in there. And I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm happy they're happy and things are moving along. So. I don't know if that, that addresses it good enough, Amy. I um, I feel like the analogy that I've used with my own self is I feel like kind of uh, the weak one in the herd all of a sudden, and you feel really you feel really vulnerable to the lion, you know, that's Definitely. coming at you. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah, I, I think first, stepping back for all of us, I, I think all of us have felt that shock and that sort of being left behind uh, issue. So I think the first thing to put on the table is this is a universal thing that we've all felt. It's not unusual and we're all going through it and we will continue to cycle in and out of this confidence issue uh, because it's not over yet, right? Just because it happens once, it doesn't mean it's not gonna continue to happen. And it's up to us, as I have told people, it, in Parkinson's, our effort is not to manage the highs, it's to manage our lows. It's those troughs that we get in and how do we get out? But it starts yeah. with admitting that we have it, right? Yeah. And we will never be where we once were, but that's okay once we accept it. Sure, I, I agree with that, Kevin. Because I think in hindsight, I look at it, I, I was, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> oh true that's a very wise thing you know kevin i mean tom you I've, i think i've known you for at least five years now and i can't believe how similar our story is um in, in regards to work um i i left work i i sold my business for very much the same reasons that tom did i um the, the, the business was doing great. I just felt that um, I, the anxiety that I, that I was feeling, um, I just was not as effective as I could. I could be, I just became very cautious. And as a small business owner, that was, you know, you need to be cautious, but you know, you need to take some risks too. And I just felt myself be just changing. So, um, and then after I sold it, it's an industry that I was involved with for, for, you know, for years. And I, and I had very similar feelings, um, but it was the right thing to do. And, and, and I was able to channel my energy to other areas like, you know, volunteering for the Davis Finney foundation and some other things that, that are very, um, 
rewarding. But I, Amy, what I you know specifically you know talk about um, an, something that um, that that I was comfortable doing that the Parkinson's has made me a shy away from. Um, you know, I always was very comfortable speaking, you know, to, to other people making, pre, making presentations. I was, you know, I was in basically in sales my whole life. So, you know, making presentations and preparing and be, trying to being on was, you know, that was all part of success really. And I found that I wasn't as good at that as I used to be. And then I, then I started really becoming self-conscious about it. Um, so much so that there was a, uh, I was on a, um, board of a, uh, a college in, in Eastern Pennsylvania and, um, I, I was a committee chair and, and I got so bad that I couldn't, when we had full board meetings, I couldn't even address the group. I had to have somebody from the committee do it for me because I, I'd get so nervous. I'd, I'd forget what I was going to talk about. Um, but the, what, what, what I did was I then after I left, after I, I resigned from that and I got involved with the Davis Finney Foundation, I started putting myself in situations where I had to do it. And, um, and, 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 and I, I had become, I'm not saying I'm really good at it because that would not be the case, but, but I'm, I'm more comfortable doing it. I've, I've kind of relearned how to do it but, it, but it has to be the right subject. It has to be something that I'm really comfortable with. How about anybody else? Are you? Are there other areas that you used to feel really confident in that you've kind of fallen off of and trying to trying to regain? Other? Well, just to add to your conversation, we're in a very performance based world, so we have body performance, and then we have other kinds of performance. But when your body performance starts to fail, everybody can see it right away. Right. We also often many of us not everyone has cognitive impairment of some sort of some level whether it's just simple brain fog or increase in add or something like that you know that's why i'm so looking around that's my excuse and i'm sticking to it that's why i have add but i think the thing is with this is we have to sort of kick start ourselves because it turns out that when we're when we're uncomfortable we have to change things that's when we grow so we have to think of a whole new way of living and working and being with each other. And that can make people feel insecure. Change is hard. Right. You know, we're kind of inside out. We're turned inside out. It's hard to be so vulnerable yeah. in our society. Mm. Yeah, it, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of suffering in feeling embarrassed or feeling ashamed or feeling less than or feeling incompetent. And for me, I just, um, I don't know if you guys watched Ted Lasso, but I've been taking my cues from him lately. <laughs> And uh, there's this one scene in season one of Ted Lasso where he's playing darts. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah. yeah. Best and, episode ever. Yeah, it's the best. And he, uh, his thing was exactly the thing that now I use all the time. He said, you know, people underestimate, underestimate me and I always felt self-conscious. And then I realized that uh, you need to be curious, not judgmental. So, um, so uh, you know, I said, that's a really good idea. And let's just be curious about what it's like to live with Parkinson's instead of feeling other things. So you su substitute uh, curiosity in whenever I'm feeling the suffering of sort of um, the shame or the embarrassment or the uncertainty. And that, that sort of helps a lot, you know, yeah. just sort of open your mind up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anxiety is a big, anxiety is a big, it's a big problem. Right. Uh, it's tied up in all of all of this. It's tied up in a, in a regular life, and it's also tied up in right. a life that has sudden change and uncertainty. Because you're living with an incurable progressive disease. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, you know, I'm going to go out there and be a little boastful and say that I used to feel like I was the master of the universe in my field. Yeah, no, I think that other than that, and then we had, yeah, and my, neuro, my neurologist told me that Parkinson's is a disease that really plagues type A personalities that are super achievers. Yeah. And I think if we look across this panel, everyone on this panel is a super achiever. And to go from this world where you're on everybody's Rolodex, everybody wants to call and talk to you to a world where all of a sudden no one's calling you. 
your emails become junk mail from Saks Fifth <laughs> Avenue and all these other places. <laughs> and you wonder what happened to all those really important emails I used to get, right? And that's sort of where I'm coming from. You know, I, I, in my life, I'd sort of figured out how to adjust and pivot to different roles to accommodate my, you know, inability to argue and debate vehemently, you know, at a board meeting. Or, but so I felt like, I was finding a way to adjust. But last month I got, I in a re, re, corporate restructuring, I got laid off, right? And so now all of a sudden it, all that, re, that re-pivoting to find my place was turned on its head and I'm going through it again. Mm -hmm. So I think we just constantly have to pivot mm -hmm. to find our new place and it's mm -hmm. gonna continue. Yeah. Michelle brings up a good point in the in the chat in that um, it's a it's helped her and I think it's a really good idea to just talk about it with others right be in a group situation the more that you are uh, open about it the less anxiety and, and nerves that you feel about your uh, your newfound lack of confidence Karen yeah you're muted Karen. you're muted hi there. We seem to be talking on the professional end of things. Um, yeah. But for, for myself, um, I quit working as soon as I was diagnosed. And I wasn't really intending to do that. But I was struggling a lot professionally. I had a very high pressure job, which required a high level of multitasking and complex thinking. I worked as a nurse anesthetist in the operating room. And I needed great manual dexterity, quick response times, accuracy in the use of my hands, um, mainly thinking. I, I had a lot of anxiety. I think that was the first symptom that presented itself was difficulty with anxiety. And of course, my tremor would get worse when I was anxious. And I found myself ill-equipped to deal with life-threatening situations rapidly and responsibly. And so initially I took a step back thinking that I would regroup and get medication and be stabilized medically speaking and then be able to return to my profession. But that is not how that happened for me. And in taking that step back, I think that the confidence that I needed to build was how to be relevant in a new capacity in a new social circle mm -hmm. and sort of honing in on things that maybe I had never done before. My job did not involve a lot of public speaking and I found myself uh, engaging in that new sort of role in volunteer work that I was doing and being able to sit in front of an audience despite having tremor or various things that I was feeling self-conscious about in light in in the setting of losing myself professionally really helped me to gain confidence with the next thing that I would try mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah yeah so just you know feeling feeling whatever it is that you feel and just doing it right yeah or knowing that it was okay to to I felt a great weight lifted off my shoulders it was okay to be anxious and underperforming yeah. for the first time in my life because i no longer had someone's life in my hands when i took a step back from work i felt that okay it's all right to be having a bad day or a bad hour or a bad week for that matter it wasn't there wasn't room for error in my work and so when i was able to take that step back i i felt at peace in my body Whereas before I felt just battling my body to stay as, um, as good, if you will, as I was before this happened to me. What about in, um, in your social circles and your friendships and the things that you used to do for fun and still do? That was hard for me because I, I had a lot of social interactions at work and I think that I had to rebuild all of that, um, yeah. but quickly found a new community. Kevin. Yeah, to me, the biggest thing that um, maybe hurt me was friends through work that I thought were friends stopped calling. 
But maybe that was the hardest thing of all. And maybe it was because of guilt on their part. Or maybe it was they just didn't want to kick, you know, hear our, our continuous stories. But I think people that I, that I thought were really close to me kind of let you down. But on the flip side, new people emerge that all of a sudden rise to the, to the occasion. And you find these newfound friends that are always there for you. And so I think that that's been my silver lining. You I can think it's great, that. you know, for all of us. I totally agree with you on that, Kevin. I, I experienced much the same thing. But at the same time, I think uh, I've always I've always kept the I've done I took the burden to keep in touch with the folks. I mean, I, I know I realize some people have struggled dealing with with someone who's been diagnosed with a with a uh, degenerative disease, and most of them don't even understand what you're talking about when you tell them we've got degen uh, degenerative disease. But at any rate, you know the uh, both socially and professionally in those two worlds, uh, I experienced a lot of that that same kind of thing. So, you know, so, some people still ask me, "So, how have you been feeling lately? Are you getting better?" I'm like, uh, well. I get that a lot. They're like, so, "Oh, I heard there was a cure. I read an article where like, I'm like, really? Yeah. Tell me more. Was it mice or people or when's it coming <laughs> my way? Yeah. Good day, I'm all nice. ears. Yeah. Or or exactly. they just, or they just won't talk about it, right? Yeah. You know, they, they, they just, they don't even want to go there. People are, people are definitely uncomfortable and don't yeah. always know what the words to say are. So mm -hmm, sometimes right. they don't say anything. I'm guilty of that myself with yeah. people who I know. I, you know, something bad happens to them and I sometimes, I don't step up like I should. So again, I just, I try, try really, really hard mm -hmm. to um, just be curious about why they dropped, you know, why they're not calling instead of trying to make, instead of trying to, instead of giving in to the feeling of feeling bad about it. Mm -hmm. But I also have this, um, I have this sort of tension and I'm sure that I, that you guys do too. And a lot of people do too, which is you get this diagnosis and all of a sudden you want to do everything. Everything becomes really urgent. Your bucket list all of a sudden is right in front of you. Right. And then at the same time, uh, all those things on your bucket list, you wonder like, I, can I even do those? I don't even know. So then I tend to sort of, you know, retreat to my little lair. And especially with COVID, we've been, you know, inside for two and a half years, I've gotten really comfortable inside my house. And uh, sometimes I just don't want to leave. <laughs> that isolation is so popular that they've done studies that prove isolation expedites all the conditions of our disease. Yes, I know, it's right? Yeah. That's the tension. There's like tension to just yeah. go out and do everything and, and that, and, but yet you kind of just want to hunker down and hide at the same time. How to time. be together, how to be alone. Yeah, yeah. What do you guys do about that? How do we participate? Steve, how do you participate in social activities? In social activities? Yeah, because you, um, you moved to a new community too, right? So you were- In a, you were in a new community? Now. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. so when, when, after I sold the business, a couple of years later, Nancy and I moved up to Saratoga and we, and we, didn't, we didn't know anyone. Um, and, and I really, you know, going back to, you know, like uh, what, what Tom was saying before, I, I really missed, I missed work. I, I missed the, you know, I, I kind of just missed being in kind of in the game. And I was able to find, um, it's called SCORE. It's, 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 it's a yeah. national organization that, that does small, small business coaching. So the great thing is, is I get to work with small businesses and 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 have a lot of fun, and then it then the meeting's over and they do all the work, and I meet with them again two weeks or a month later. So that really was a wonderful release for for me. And and you know, um, when I left, um, and I don't know if any of you guys felt this way, but I, I had people like they go, "Well, you seem fine. Like, what? Why? Why? Wh you know, why are you selling the business? You seem fine. which really made me feel guilty." you know? Um, and, uh, and, I, and I started questioning myself and my wife had to keep reminding me, you did this because you have Parkinson's and you want to spend the quality time, as much quality time with your family and doing the things you like, which is the truth. But, but with SCORE, I went into it, meeting these people for the first time. They didn't know me, you know? Um, they, it was just a great, that was a great professional change. Um, you know, for not, you know, and social. What's Did you that? get a tattoo like Michael J. Fox? 
I'm copying. No. Only he has a turtle, I think. Did anybody get a tattoo when you got diagnosed? I got a tattoo when I got married. <laughs> Maybe I should get another one now. Yeah. You've come um, this far. What else? Yeah. Do and Lauren, Lauren says, um, curious, not judgmental goes both ways. That's exactly right. Um, curious as to why the friends that we used to have may not be so supportive, right? I have a um, lot of ideas about that one. I just think they're uncomfortable going there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Capacity. Right. And when, yeah. when I was diagnosed, really when I was diagnosed, I shared it with 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 everybody, I, and I it started with you know inside with my family, and then I shared it with uh, my, my my colleagues at work, and ultimately to my employees and, and the staff, and that really helped because it took away a lot of the you know, a lot of the wondering why I was walking funny and and doing things odd, comparatively speaking. And so I think that sort of set the tone and uh, the, the, the expectation was there that I wouldn't be at 100% anymore. So that, that really helped me a lot. So I, I always encourage people to do that if you can. I mean, I know that sometimes there's reasons that people cannot do that in, in, a, in a public or professional environment, but I did the same thing. I did the same thing with uh, in, in the social sphere as well. And, and uh, you know, everybody, everybody knows, they don't clearly understand, but uh, they, all, they all know what's happening. And, and it, it just, it takes the pressure off me to act any certain way or, or react any certain way. I don't know how all of you all are, but I have a hard time even just going out with my friends now who are, who accept me into a crowded restaurant with lots of background noise. I, I, the cacophony of all of that just irritates me, you know? Like doorbells. Like doorbells, exactly. <laughs> but I, honestly, I can't hear and uh, listen and talk at the same time anymore. Yeah. It's very frustrating for me. I've switched to day fun instead of night fun. So, and it's hard, you know, it's, it's, everything's a shift. Yeah. And then, and then when it comes to physical, the long, you know, the dreaded, you know, long day out of the house. I, um, because of, you know, because of COVID, we haven't, a lot of us haven't been really out there doing our kayaking and stuff um, or traveling. And so, yeah, I'm a little nervous. And I spoke, I was, we were speaking about this topic before and I was talking about how, yeah, I used to love to ski and I don't know if I can ski anymore. Uh, and, and Karen has a story about that, I think, right? With your dad. Yeah, yeah. I. Well, my father, watching my father grow up with Parkinson's disease was, um, it, it gives a little different perspective to my Parkinson's disease because I'm constantly comparing myself to him. And that's not always fair to myself either, because as you know, one person, one person with Parkinson's is very different from the next person with Parkinson's. But one thing I did uh, appreciate about my father is his willingness to continue to do the things he loved and modify them to fit where he was at you know uh, he he would ski for example you know maybe eight or ten years into his diagnosis but he wouldn't ski all day long he wouldn't ski you know 12 runs a day um, not as many vertical feet but you know if he just sat on top of the mountain and had hot chocolate and did one or two runs in a day that was a successful day for him and I saw a joy in him to be able to spend time with his family doing what he loved and being able to uh, change the way that he enjoyed skiing. But what, what I experienced, Amy, that I wanted to share with you, because I know you would like to ski and are a little nervous about it, but when I ski with the Breckenridge Outdoor Education Center um, and the National Adaptive Abilities Center in uh, Utah, which is in Park City, um, they can pretty much get anybody down the hill. I mean, you can, that Parkinson's are not. Vision, visually impaired people can ski. People without mm -hmm. limbs can ski. They may do it differently. You know, mm -hmm. so I've, I've seen people ski with, like for myself, I'm a pretty confident skier, but I would get dystonia and my leg would not uh, be working for um, so yeah, yeah. I couldn't get the ski to turn because my foot was turning inside my boot. And, 
you know, you need to be able to have translate each little small movement of your muscles in your upper leg down to the foot to make the tur turn of the ski. So what I did for an adaptation was very minimal. They carried a chair for me as a backpack. And then when I would get to Estonia, I would simply just sit on the mountain in my chair and wait until the dystonia calmed down and then I could resume skiing. So the nice thing about having skiing with them is they would carry the chair for me. And if I just wasn't feeling up to it in that moment, I'd say, hey, I'm gonna sit for a minute. That was my adaptation. You know, I tried skiing without riggers on my hands, which takes about 60% of the, the work out of the turn. Um, you know, others that needed a little more adaptive support skied with what they called ski legs, which were like a, a walker with skis. Yeah. yeah. Or even fully tethering someone where someone would ski behind you and you would be in a mono ski and use just sort of uh, skis on your hands and all you had to do was lean your body. But I've seen people with very severe and advanced Parkinson's skiing. They may not I be on their legs, but they're skiing. I want the equivalent of that little chair for like my life. Uh, you can have it. Every in my life. And there's another, there's another, um, there's another organization called Peak to Peak. Have you guys heard of that? It's a, it's a, an organization that runs a hike in the um, Pacific Northwest every July. It's free. It's for people with Parkinson's and they do all that. It's all assistive and uh, they, encourage people to um to sign up and go and that sounds like a really great program too uh and it's really i think it's really intense but at the same time they have people with parkinson's at all levels and uh, i'm thinking about going next july next august i think kevin yeah one more note on skiing and i don't want to belabor because i think there are people in our audience who don't ski uh, and it may be viewed as so, sort of an elitist sport out there, but there are ways to ski for less than you expect. Um, the Breckenridge Adaptive Ski Program is phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, in, in one sense, and it's very reasonably priced, and it's accessible to just about anyone. Um, the other thing to tell you about is that I've been collaborating with some of the ski instructors in Vail uh, and they've told me that there is an epic adaptive ski pass, which is about a third of the price of a, of a lift pass. So I just bought mine and I've told a few friends and they bought theirs as well. So it's something you should look for. And then they're proposing programs where we can have discounted housing, lessons, rentals, and everything else as part of it. But the thing that I said, I, we should not belabor skiing. It's really just finding whatever finds you joy. Yeah. Because if it's not skiing, it could be cycling, it could be dance, it could be karaoke. Just hiking, just a day out on a, you know, just That's day out right. to hike. Yeah. yeah. Just sure. getting out there, finding what brings you joy, mm -hmm. and then just building up, as, as I say, a training program to allow you to do it. The trading is half the fun, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got, got I go to a, a little gym around the corner that's twenty four seven, uh, and and sometimes I call Davis and he'll join me, and we'll set up little obstacle courses, right? We'll set bosu balls to stand on and throw balls at each other, trying to recite the the months of the year backwards. And you, it's pretty amazing how much fun you can have with just a few <laughs> little props. Uh, that's the beauty of where we are is that we can find fun pretty much anywhere. Just challenge our brain a little bit and everything else turns to an occupational therapy drill. How do you take that first step to get out of the house? Like, how do you get the initiative to do, to do this stuff? Uh, believe me, if I'm going to go at three o'clock today and at 2.30, I'm going to be saying, gosh, I'm going to cancel because apathy gets in the way. All it's a the big time. deal. Yeah, it's hard to, it's, hard to, it's inertia too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the challenge. It's just getting up and really knowing that by doing something, you kind of shake off that, that issue. I, I mean, you should see me jump rope. I'm horrible now. You know, I used to jump rope for 15 minutes at a time, right? 
Now, if I get five skips, I'm I'm elated. But what I what I tell my friends and my girlfriend is like, today I'll do three jump skips. Now the next day I'll do five, and then I'll do ten, and just slowly build these little successes for yourself. You'll that find that if you do that instead of saying monumentally tomorrow I'm going to you know hike the Camino, right? You can't just go out and hike the Camino. I want to do that too. Shout out to Carol Clutney. The uh, the hiking organization is pass to pass, not not peak to peak. Thanks, thanks, Lee. That was a monumental find for you. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, you... I think um, what what I tried to do. I'm not sure how long ago it was, but a while into having Parkinson's after being diagnosed, I started to feel like I had to make a choice of things that I wanted to do, things that I could do kind of analyze skiing and I thought maybe I don't want to separate my shoulder because that would set me back over here or do this or do that. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to do with whatever. And then I thought to myself, it's really the challenge isn't what I can do. It's what can I talk myself back into doing? Because it's really easy for us with Parkinson's to accept the fact that we have Parkinson's per se and give up on those things. So I make the challenge talking myself back into doing those things. And that's, that's almost, I don't want to call it fun, but uh, if I don't do that, I wouldn't travel anymore. I would find an easy way to stay home. I'd find an excuse not to go anywhere. If, if it was hiking, I would find a reason not to hike anymore. Uh, my wife and I were out hiking the other day, and I forgot my pills. And I was Ooh, like, oh, out, right? That's my, that's my fear. And, and, and I, I was totally, totally freaked out about it. And I thought, you know, well, the best way to get through a, a, a period like that is just to stay real calm and just keep walking. She goes, well, do you want me to go get the car? I'm like, honey, what are you going to do to get the car? I, you can't get to where we're at. Let's just keep going. I'll make it. And I just stayed calm. And, and by the time we got there, I was in pretty rough shape, but I, I survived it. And of course, I got in big trouble for forgetting my pills, but that's neither here nor there. But again, I think the, the challenge is in, in talking yourself back into doing those things that you used to do and you love to do. I, 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 I hate to give up on things just because of Parkinson's. Right. But you said that was the fun part, talking yourself back into it. Well, how, it is. how do you do it? Like, what do you do? <laughs> it's, I have this internal argument with myself. It's like, you know. Because <laughs> you like to argue, so that's fun for you. Yeah, maybe it is. I'm not sure <laughs> what it is. But uh, again, I think that accepting the challenge is really the fun part. It's, it's just, yeah. you know, can I challenge myself to go to New York City and sit through the U.S. Open tournament this past couple of weeks? My wife and I went. And it really was a challenge for me to talk myself back into getting on an airplane flying across the country with the mask on, going to New York City where, you know, who knows what can happen, that kind of stuff, and, and all the anxiety and all the fears and everything else. And physically, you know, what, what, what's going to happen to me when we get there and it's 1130 at night and I'm usually long sleep by then and I'm way off, off my meds. You know, how, how am I going to be able to do that? We managed it. We managed it just fine. A wheelchair out to the car, got, took the Uber to, to downtown and, and uh, got into the hotel just fine. Everything seemed to work out okay, as long as I didn't let it get the best of me. I was, I was bound and determined to, to, you know, to keep myself on the high and dry side of that. So it worked. Tom, were you happy you did it? Oh, yeah. God, what a tournament this year. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. That was an amazing, that was an amazing tournament. What about ping pong? Does anyone here play ping pong? That's yeah. good for agility. And I would love to play ping pong. Try pickleball. Play anywhere, anytime. Pickleball, hey. ping pong. That's, wait, turn that around, Kevin. Oh, oh. Harry. Gotta play ping pong. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what everybody was saying. Um, I th it is really, really important not to stop or just, just stop doing what you love to do. But um, you also have to realize that you may not be able to do what you love to do as well as you used to do it. And um, I, you know, I, I, I have learned that the hard way on a few things. But um, I, you know, the only thing that I have quit doing is snowboarding. That I just realized that it's just a little too slippery for me. Um, but, but it is, it is important to keep, you know, to, to just, just try it, keep, keep working at it. And, and I agree with what everybody's saying, but yeah, you know, I, I, I've skied my whole life as, a, as an example. And, and I know now that I can't go up and do some of the runs that I used to do. It's just not safe. Um, so that's, that's just, and that's been hard for me, you know, just, it's just an ego thing, you know, 
I can't ride my bike as fast as I used to. I can't <laughs> ski as I can't ski what I used to, but but um you still do it and you love it, you know. Um so. one of the um one of the things that I love about skiing, forget about the um the trappings of it, is just when you're doing it, you can't think about anything else, mm -hmm. right? And that's a that's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> Everything yeah. is just out of your yeah. mind, except for just making that next turn. So when I was talking to somebody about, you know, being afraid of trying it again, they said, well, just try something where you get that feeling again. It doesn't have to be skiing. It can be yeah. anything. Yeah. Like ping pong. Like ping yeah. pong, right? Because you can't think about anything else. You just have to get the ball. Yeah. Nice the ball. Is, not, yeah, right? The nice thing is we fail. We can go, Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, you have I have a million excuse. excuses for everything, but that's my favorite one. And sometimes it even really is true. I think I also wanted to just add to this integration. Like when we don't integrate what we think we believe about ourselves, like when we take on too much, when we have these ideas about who we think we are. Yeah. What if we dropped all those and just tried something new, almost like a child. So this curiosity that you all speak of that everyone here has mentioned, and this awe and this, you know, I wonder what's going to happen next. We just need to keep trying new things. And if we fail, oh, well, we will be pre better prepared for if we actually fall. Because a lot of these exercises help us with our balance and agility right. and as we struggle with. Yeah. Kind of like seeing karaoke. <laughs> kind of helps. Uh, which we're going we're gonna to start in a few minutes. Heather. Oh, love it. I, um, I, take, I take a lot of lessons from my mother. She's taught me a lot. And um, she's, she's someone who's never complained in her life, not once that I can think of. And I remember when I was in high school and she had, uh, she suffered a third degree burn because she had this whole pot of boiling water called on her leg. And she ended up in a wheelchair with um, her several weeks. And when I would come home from school and her leg would be completely uh, covered in, in big blisters. And she would, she would say to me, Amy, come over here. Isn't this interesting how the skin heals itself? That was, that was just her way of dealing with all the pain. <laughs> And the suffering, and so I, it was a, it's a really great lesson. It's kind of like, isn't this interesting how this works? Uh, instead of, it's just a mind shift. I think it's a, you know, I didn't know that I was learning that lesson until now. Kevin, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna address Terry's question on having too many tasks in a day and being overwhelmed. I, I find that, you know, I used to be the kind of person that would do lists. And I love checking off those lists, you know, and it was almost, almost kind of like, you know, my, my day, yeah, there you go with post-its. Make lists. But what I find now is that if I'm in the middle of something and someone throws me a new task, it completely throws me off. And I'm, I just don't have the capacity to say, take on two things at the same time. And so I usually will politely say, can I finish what I'm doing first? And then I'll come back to the next thing. But the worst thing that I think you can do to Parkinson's people is throw them too many things at once. Davis taught me that. Is that right? Yeah. I watch him be very careful about what he chooses, just a few things. And he has yeah. a million things going on. So. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, question just came, a question just came through that I think is really interesting. Um, and it's, we talked about leaving our jobs because of Parkinson's, but what if you can't afford it? Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a really tough one to, to address. It is tough. I mean, I'm still in mine for mostly that reason. And, um, and we, we've had a couple of webinars about that too. And uh, a lot of it, a lot of the decision-making is uh, sort of acknowledging this really big problem and trying to find ways around it. Um, and there's lots of resources out there and help if uh, the person who asked that question wants to get in touch. I have, I still have those resources from when we talked about it in the fall. And there's no, there's of course no easy answer, but you should know that there are a lot of people out there who um, are in that same boat and, you know, yeah, but, but it's every day you, you decide to, to get up and and do your best that day. So um, I'm happy to talk to you. More. Yeah, there isn't there's not one one single answer to help uh, address that. You know, completely. I think it's really uh, a case by case thing. Yeah. But uh, 
you know, companies are in some ways obligated to at least try to level the playing field for you with your with your situation, you know, with, with Parkinson's or whatever it is that you're dealing with, to try to to find a place for you to still fit in to to keep working, you know, because it and uh, and feel that value of yourself and and, uh, and and still get paid for doing what you need to do, but. It may not be what you were doing, but they, they there is some yes. obligation, some level of legal legal obligation for them to at least provide something for you to do while you're while you're still able to work. Yeah, we've had some we've had some really good speakers on that in the last year or so. I recommend getting a good lawyer to represent you. Uh, it made all the difference for me. It took the anxiety and the stress away in negotiating my disability and. Again, they're people, that's what they do for a living. And if you can find someone who can be your ombudsman and, and advocate for you and work through the insurance companies or disability or wherever you have, it's really great to find someone like that. They can also be very expensive though too, but there are some, there are nonprofits, community legal services that do the same. Most In mostly every county, they have um, a county bar association that you can contact and try to find uh, nonprofit attorneys who will help you in that same realm. Okay. And as our needs change, we can get different kinds of professional help outside of our medical care. Most of my help comes from peers right here. Like Karen and I have talked about the intersection of sobriety and Parkinson's. Now, many diseases are sort of stigmatized or shamed. And many are not, certainly there's nothing shameful about Parkinson's whatsoever, of course, but people who don't understand often think I'm drunk, which, you know, once upon a time might have also been true. So both things could have been true. But now that I know that I'm, you know, I just don't drink anymore because it doesn't, doesn't suit me. It's easy for me to say, hey, wait a minute. How could they think I'm drunk? You know, how dare they? When in fact, we're trying to educate people, you know, it's not like a terrible faux pas per se. Karen, we've talked about this a lot, right? This intersection. Yes. I, I wanted to circle back around to one of the things that Jody um, mentioned about not being able to um, quit working. I mean, not everyone has the benefit of having disability insurance or, um, you know, their social security, which is a whole other issue. But I think that, um, I think that sometimes you have to think outside the box about doing things um, a different way. Maybe um, maybe trying to uh, change sort of the way that you're working, um, the way that you're uh, interacting with your employer about your needs. Um, I don't know, I'm just gonna take a pause for a second. There are also different kinds of employers, some of whom are friendlier to uh, people with Parkinson's than others. And, um, you know, some of the some of the high pressure private sector corporations um, are less friendly because of the constituents who they serve. Right. Um, but some academic or government or nonprofit sectors are a little bit friendlier and sometimes you're able to make a move into those and transfer your skills over. And nothing, is, none of it is easy or, you know, gonna be handed to any of us, but it's definitely something that is an option. Uh, I, uh, I reached out to Gaynor. I wanted to get her um, comment on this topic about confidence. Gaynor, who used to sit on our council, uh, and she said, she moved into advocacy from journalism after her diagnosis, and she doesn't think that she lost her confidence, just rechanneled it. And uh, the advocacy provides her with the, I guess, the distraction. It's not about her, right? When, when, it's, when you're out there doing the things that we're all talking about now, the public speaking, the all day long, you know, the feeling exhausted, the fatigue, when you're out there doing it on behalf of other people, Sometimes it's a lot easier and it's not about yourself, which I thought was a really good point. She also said, remember that no one really thinks about you as much as you think that they do. So 
<laughs> which, which we all need to be reminded of because we're so self-conscious, but most people don't really notice us. When Mostly you don't know if your feet are going to work, it's easy to be self-conscious. And we stand up from a table and we do that little Tim Conway shuffle thing and we're kind of like, whoa, you know, people are rushing over maybe to try to catch us if they are paying attention. Most people are just looking at their phones, though. So we probably- Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, a lot of this is just internal and um, stuff, for, stuff for us to work on piece by piece. Yeah, you know, keep, telling, keep challenging yourselves to to stay in the game, you know, as much as you can work, uh, social, right. um, physical, all that. I mean, that's one thing we can always control is, is our ability to challenge ourselves to, to keep after it. I mean, you shouldn't do stuff that's completely off the wall. Maybe you should, I don't know. Maybe I should try doing some completely crazy stuff. Anyone want to talk about drifting with me? I do. Okay, let's go. Crazy stuff, yep, I love that. <laughs> Hi folks. Tom, I'm, that's a great segue to as we close our hour together today on this really important topic is could everybody go around and just give one piece of advice or one takeaway, one piece of homework that you would like to challenge the audience to think about? Um, not complicated, but something they could do during the next month and uh, to regain their confidence in some area and then come back next month and we'll start with people giving us some ideas of how they how they did in that so tom do you have a i don't want to put you on the spot but do you have a piece of advice that you could shed sure i'll challenge everybody to talk yourself into doing that one thing that you wanted to do for a while that you just keep putting it off or finding an excuse not to do all right You know what, Tom, can you record your, yourself uh, telling yourself to do that and then share it with all of us? And then we can just play it every time we want. We that, and that <laughs> I love his voice. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I would say put, put together that things to do list and do it. Mm -hmm. Do one thing in the next no, month? Do, put together what you need to do and do it. And, and so actually, this is a good challenge for myself. So I'm going to do it also. All right. I think overcoming apathy, one of the things that I find helpful is to put it on the calendar. Like, you know, I'm going to take a bike ride around the neighborhood. I don't have to ride on a busy trail or around cars right now, but I want to learn how to ride a bike. So I want to take my bike to a neighborhood where there are no cars and ride my bike. And I put it on the calendar, like Wednesday at two o'clock. If it's not raining, that's what I'm going to do. Great advice. Heather, Kevin, Amy? I recommend extreme flexibility. I'm gonna go the other direction from what people are saying. Don't get me wrong, I have my little bucket list, but I'm gonna go with, how do I feel today? What are my specific capacities today in this hour, in this moment? And we'll move from there. Now that drives a lot of planners crazy. So not everybody has that luxury. I mean, I have to work too, and I can't do that work. So take, take, their, you know, take everybody's advice to heart about what your lifestyle is. How about you guys? Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, for me, it's it's like finding the thing that you hate the most to do your weaknesses because we tend to focus on our strengths and, and turn your weakness into something that you actually really get joy out of trying to improve. I would say that's one. And the second one is gratitude. Be, be just thankful for what you can do. Yeah, big one. Great. There's a whole lot of people that are way worse off than we are. That's right. Amy, do you have a takeaway or a piece of homework for folks? Yeah, I do. I, I say find somebody who inspires you and uh, think about a piece of advice that they've given. And for me, it's my mom. Uh, shout out to moms today. Um, Holly's mom, Abby, I know is out there. My mom's name is Arlene. She's in Silver Spring. And, and that whole that whole mindset of when you're suffering or when you're feeling bad, just sort of flipping it and putting that Ted Lasso curiosity in and saying, isn't this interesting? Where's this going? Um, can sometimes shake you out of that, that darkness a little bit and make you look to the future. Thanks, mom. <laughs> 
Well, thank you all, Karen, Amy, Heather, Kevin, Steve, and Tom. Your wisdom, your lived experience is so important as we try to help others, encourage others to get unstuck and move forward. Thank you all. Appreciate you being here and we'll see you back in a month's time. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody.